there's been millions of people who've said it, you know, beautifully about it. It's just like the person who you're closest to um, can have the ability to also just um, really wreck you. Yeah, wreck you. And um, like a wrecking ball. Right. And they say the opposite of love is not. <laughs> she hate. says, right. Right. Oh, yeah. I Good right. Well, I like Miley Cyrus references. So. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Attached, a podcast about the loved ones we're attached to and the good, the bad, and the ugly advice about those relationships that maybe we shouldn't be so attached to. We here at Attached want to share ways to enhance your relationships and debunk all of that bad relationship advice using science. I'm Dr. Patricia Robertson out of the University of Tennessee. I'm Dr. Sarah Woods out of UT Southwestern Medical Center. And I'm Dr. Sessa Nagash from San Diego State University. Today, Sesson will bring us a conversation about the slap heard round the world at the Oscars a few months back. Then in our academic deep dive segment, we're going to discuss the academic article, What Happens When Romantic Couples Discuss Personal Loss, Relational, Emotional, and Physiological Impact. That was my attempt at a dramatic reading. Uh, we'll work on it. <laughs> And then in good or bad advice, we'll be talking about quotes from the past two seasons of Bridgerton. I know you guys have been waiting with bated breath. I'm going to slip now into a British accent. Just kidding. I won't. But if you have heard any advice you'd like us to talk about, send it to us. You can email us at attachedpodcast at gmail.com. Tweet us, Facebook us, get at us on Instagram, all at attached podcast or go to attachedpodcast.com and send us a message. Also, wherever you listen to our podcast, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, whatever uh, tickles your fancy, um, please rate and review it on that platform. But before we get to all of the goodness of this episode, how are you guys doing? How you been? It's actually been a while since we've all three been together. Um, what's, what's up? I am currently enjoying that part of spring where flowers come back to life and oh, plants come back to life. I love it. And it looks so beautiful and it feels like I can take credit for it <laughs> when we have really documented, I think, on this podcast how I really do not have any gardening skills whatsoever. So it's in this really nice phase of spring where everything looks bright and colorful before the flowers realize which yard they have come up into <laughs> and they shrivel and die in a month or so. So right now I'm taking so much credit. We take tours. I force my daughter to take tours of my landscaping. Like, oh wow, gosh. look at all these flowers that I have brought back to life. <laughs> really, it's nature. It is not nurture. <laughs> I am sure it's absolutely beautiful and hopefully it will last longer than you expect. Crossing my fingers. <laughs> Sess, what's new in your world? Or old. That's new again. Oh, wow. Um, lots of moving <laughs> parts for sure. But I think yeah. um, the thing I'm working to get excited about and super nervous about is a new puppy. We are. Um, <gasps> oh, you yes. decided? Yeah. We decided. Her name is Mabley. We have not yet received oh. her. She is still um, with their breeder and, um, you know, getting bigger so she can be um you know flown over to us so we're waiting uh probably. there was a lot of research that was involved <laughs> you know <laughs> to help myself um we did a lot of you know work to try to figure out like the perfect dog fit for us and maybe is it hopefully <laughs> she's uh really tiny and really young and so i keep Aww. hearing like little voices of oh wow you're taking on a puppy and I'm like what does that mean oh. I know it's hard work but like tell me to what extent I need to be worried here um surely it's not harder than a newborn I really don't want it to be as hard as a newborn no. either <laughs> that is a lot of work um I mean I think from dog to dog of course is like human to human we differ so um perhaps maybe we will um spare us from you know all the learnings that she has to do and just sort of innately picks up things but sure uh, yeah that's how it works that sounds about <laughs> right i think i picked that dog right like that's the sure, one right. um, <laughs> my, that's the one my picker's really good i know um 
so yeah, she comes on the 13th, I believe, is the date that they have guaranteed us. And so we're excited, but I'm also just like looking around my home going like, is this the last time you'll look like this? You'll smell like this? Like, it's going to be different. Uh, so excited, nervous. But oh my Ray goodness. does not know. It's going to be a surprise. So <gasps> that's a oh, good thing. Oh, yes, for sure. Surely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I did want to preload him with like 9,000 um, videos about how to prepare for a little puppy. Like I'm all about <laughs> the preventative work in my life. Sure, so sure. I don't know that I can do that until she arrives. So maybe on the day she arrives, I go crazy with it. But we'll see. Yeah. Best of luck. <laughs> all very realistic expectations oh yeah you know that's well. how i roll i said <laughs> very regular standards i love it i can't wait to see a picture of her i'm sure she'll be absolutely precious those cute little tiny dogs are so adorable mm. um that being said no matter the size of the dog they all scare me dogs <laughs> make me very nervous not because of like being in my house i just have this fear of dogs like i don't they scare me like uh, I have to actively um, coach myself to not like go wah, 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 whenever a dog kind of like trunk comes at me and licks me. And my friends in town, like it is bizarre to them that like they make my anxiety go up. Oh, I have sure. to like, so I don't freak people out. I have to be like, okay, before I go around, like be calm, you can do this. Like, you know, like I have to talk myself through it. I don't know what it is. I've never had really a traumatic experience with dogs, but they make me very, very nervous. Um, the small ones, I think I could handle a little bit better than big ones. You're not the but. only one PR. Please know that there are a lot of people, including myself, who have always been a little bit apprehensive of dogs if not with any personal experience associated with them too. But yeah. um, there are folks out there who have that same initial, you know, reaction. But I'm super happy for you, and I'm super happy I'll be able to experience the dog through a screen. No? <laughs> so no visits in your near future, I guess. Oh, well, I'll coach you. myself to like you know take deep breaths and like be cool. It's be a cool. mini. Be it's cool. a miniature dog, so it'll be yeah. Tiny. I bet it's smaller than my cats, so probably. <laughs> oh well, spring has definitely sprung here in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. All of the pollen is out. All of the people in my family are sick. We're not sure if it's a cold or pollen, probably some combination of both. Um, it's gorgeous, but also everybody's eye is kind of twitching and nose is kind of drooling. Uh, have a little mild cough, but you know, nothing that Claritin won't fix, but we're enjoying the spring weather here. We went to the zoo yesterday. Today, uh, my husband's taking the big kids to go practice tennis. And I, it's just lovely you get to be outside. I mean, would that also include um, me doing a lot of outside garden work uh, for my husband, not necessarily with him, not necessarily voluntarily, but, you know, he needs help with the outside this time of year. So I'm like, okay, here we go. Sh hauling mulch up and down hills. So I feel like I'm also getting stronger, getting ready for like my beach bod outside in the garden. <laughs> mm, maybe not. Anyway, it's fun. I do enjoy it, but it also is maybe not like my first inclination wouldn't be like, oh my God, let's do some garden work. It would be <laughs> like, oh my God, let's drink some wine on the patio. <laughs> Just a little bit of difference. <laughs> it takes all types. <laughs> first up popping culture we learn about relationships from our friends and family but a lot of what we think about love and relationships come from what we see in pop culture for this first segment we take a moment to highlight events in pop culture that influence people's lives and how we view relationships sasan what you got for us today Yes. Yeah, so um, it's been a few weeks, certainly, um, since the slap that um, now most folks have heard of, if they're, you know, mm -hmm. at all connected to the television screen, social media, radio. Quick question interrupting. Woods, do you know what we're talking about? <laughs> I do. <laughs> so she's my, our barometer of like <laughs> of pop culture. general knowledge. <laughs> yep. Yes, I did have to be told to cue in to that <laughs> pop culture. So I was around for like the third generation takes. So, yeah. Well, I heard um, about it all the way from Mexico when I was. <laughs> did you hear about it? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And why is this making it all the way to Mexico? 
<laughs> um, but so yeah, it literally so was heard around the world. Well, yeah, kinda, just yeah, south of the yeah. world. Anyway. Right. Yeah. It's incident between Will Smith and Chris Rock at the Academy Awards. And I don't really want to rehash um, the incident or what prompted it. Um, and, it, you know, it is disturbing as it was to see someone be physically, um, you know, attacked in person. Um, I'd rather focus on the aftermath because it really okay. brought up some um, questions and thoughts for me that I thought would be great maybe to bring to the group. And um, I realized the incident happened in a very public way. So to a large extent, um, the aftermath also plays out in a very public way, right? Public opinion on the matter. You yeah. know, um, I understand it has been um, great and vast and um, people saw it. So they felt like they had something to say and felt a certain way about it. However, what really helped um, bring to life for me, um, and it's not the first time I've thought about this, but it felt different when I sort of, for the week and a half that after it happened, like all of the the opinions that came out about it, it reminded me that we have a lot to say about um, people when they engage in a transgression, um, when there's relationship conflict. And that plays out in somewhat of a public way because of social media, perhaps um, Mm. more so nowadays. Um, where people will post their conflicts on social media or um, post an opinion about something that somebody has posted in terms of an upset or hurt that they've had. And so, um, you know, let me be clear. I'm not talking about when something is posted on social media where somebody promotes misinformation or racist or social ills or ignorance or something like that and then having an opinion about that. But I'm talking about when people commit a grievance and that grievance plays out in a very public way and are exposed on social media. Um, And public humiliation is not new in our society. It's deep roots in a lot of cultural traditions that date back hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Um, During different eras in particular, there were very public ways that people were um, scrutinized for their behavior in an attempt often to course correct that behavior in the future. Um, but, you know, let's come back to present day and talk about social media. Um, in the age of social media, we have people who are enthralled with other people's struggles and challenges, um, people that they don't know or don't know really well. We can scrutinize and shame these people um, for their errors, however big or small. Um, some folks agree that they use social media to call out people so that they can um, hold them accountable. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the idea about accountability, punishing them through like public shaming, um, thinking that they're calling in for dialogue when they do something like that, or seeing it as an opportunity for others to learn. Like this is what happens when you do okay. something harmful. Um, however, when you use social media to judge or criticize or condemn people, um, I'm wondering what the effects are of that. Um, communities on the people involved in the conflict um, and whether it's productive at all and it leaves you feeling any better, mm. right? Um, so I guess that's a lot of different ideas and things that I'm wondering, but um, is it productive? Do we stand to cause more harm than good when we do something like that? Um and yeah, are we promoting a culture of relational healing when we do this? Um, I guess that's, that, yeah, it brought up a lot. And uh, I'm just curious what some of you might be thinking about that. It's a big question, and I think it's an important one. Um, I kind of think of it as definitely a double-sided sword, right? Because I think of... This call-out culture, I think without it, we probably wouldn't have the Me Too movement as big as it got, the Black Lives Matter movement as big as it got without that kind of similar uh, voice and being able to hear different perspectives and being able to hear and understand it and it be able to rapidly like wildfire go through social media. I think those are good things about that same um, call-out culture and um, opinions, but what you're saying. Also, I agree. I wonder, you know, registering your opinion like as a bullhorn into the ether or whatever it may be on topics that don't have really anything to do with you, people you don't know, um, does that do harm to you? Right? I think it could. And also, how are you contributing to improving the situation as well? If I understand what you're saying, I think that I could see 
the pros and cons of that type of culture that we're living in in social media right now. Yeah, that, you know, I've heard the term call out, right, for a long time, but more so in the last several years. Mm -hmm. But now lately I've been hearing, like, the language, like, calling in people and um, moving away from, like, addressing concerns and issues in a really public way and forcing them to speak out about it and inviting them into some difficult dialogue um, and conversations and how that perhaps promote more vulnerability and then access to change as a result. Um, Because ultimately, I think most people agree that we're seeking change, right? Like whatever the person did, we're hoping something will come from that, right? Growth, you know, course, like some kind of corrective experience. But does it actually elicit that is my question. And Mm -hmm. the research suggests it doesn't. When you put people in places where they feel defensive, where they can access their vulnerability, they don't necessarily open themselves up to growth. Yeah, so I agree with you. It's like there are two different issues simultaneously. It's the one, the single individual changing versus uh, cultural consciousness kind of changing and shifting. Um, So I completely agree with you and the research about the individual change is probably much less likely. I think it's also different when you're talking about asking for corporate change, which I think can get conflated with um, talking about individual level behavior, um, which is some of what I feel like I hear you talking about too, Patricia, that cultural shifts are important and sort of shifting the cultural narrative, which can be done potentially more rapidly on sort of larger scale social media platforms. Mm -hmm. But it's wildly different than thinking about encouraging individual level change or relationship change, which in truth most of us have no business asking for um, because yeah. we don't know these people. I don't know these people. I mean, Sesson's position in San Diego and her wild California lifestyle. <laughs> she may know all kinds of famous people out there, but these are not my people. Um, and so it, I have no position calling for change whatsoever. But um, I think uh, social media may be more effective in thinking about asking for corporate level change where it's harder to get large, powerful systems to listen. Um, that's wildly different than I think what you're talking about, Sesson, but I think maybe often treated the same, which is, I agree, really, really unhelpful. Um, and I think we see this in the level of um, smaller scale relationships and families too, maybe not on social media, but um, uh, families calling individual family members out publicly at um, I'm thinking about like holidays and Thanksgiving and dinner together, right? Like it's just wildly unproductive. Um, and it comes out of, I think a lot of times really strong emotion and historical sort of um, experiences that can sort of all culminate, but doesn't ever really tend to be helpful because you're right. People just get really defensive, understandably. It's shaming. It's intentionally shaming. Yeah, and we, people just go into survival mode, right? You go into yep. survival mode. You're not necessarily doing as anything they should. Trying, yeah, right? dig your heels in, right? 100%. Yeah, and so I think you know I consider myself an advocate for you know all the causes that are important to making sure that we are thinking about our humanity, improving our sense of you know inclusion, and making sure that we are being better human beings to each other. At the same time how we are doing that work really varies from, you know, and I have concerns that sometimes the way we show up in our advocacy is not always relational. Mm. And Mm. I think how are we having really hard conversations about how do we do this work in a way that brings people who really are harming others to the table to say, Mm. like inviting them into really critically thinking about that. And you can't bring somebody into any critical thought stage when they are in survival mode. The brain doesn't function like that, right? Um, It's primitive, it's primal, it requires a person to feel a sense of safety before they do that hard work of changing Mm -hmm. themselves in really important ways. Um, And I think, yeah, a lot of the time we show up in relationships and make errors and I think we owe it to each other to show some patience as someone works to make those shifts and it's different when somebody's saying i refuse i won't but to say well i'm going to show you out publicly because you refuse to doesn't feel like the path right so 
just thinking about how people are using social media because they're seeing themselves as an advocate for a cause, a voice, you know, putting it on a platform and using a particular situation as an example. But that situation always involves human beings, right? Actual people. Yeah, it involves actual people. Yeah, I completely agree with you, especially when fifth, sixth parties start to like pile on and it's not productive and it doesn't make sense. At the same time, there is something powerful about um, bringing, and I don't think I'm necessarily talking about this incident at the Oscars. I'm kind of talking more general now. You know, historically, um, things have been said, you know, you keep this private. And what that means a lot of times is um, abuses are kept private um, because, you know, you deal with this within the family. Um, and it can be really, really harmful too. And calling out those people in a private setting usually means they don't have the exposure and maybe they don't change. So I think there are also historical examples. I mean, I'm thinking very broadly about um, the whole entire, uh, uh, is it feminist family therapy or something like that about like a private um, women's issues um, tend to be considered private. And that's, you know, thinking about, um, abuse and poverty and household work and division of labor that you're not supposed to talk about outside the family. Um, and that also leads to um, continued um, discrimination and devaluing that um, labor and, you know, perpetuating um, abuse in some situations. I think talking about things publicly is important but finding how to talk about it, I think, is also important. I don't think we're doing it well, um, talking about some things publicly. But I think the answer isn't to it all goes private. In some instances, yes, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but I think letting things also stay in the public sphere is also really important um, as well for some instances. So finding what that balance is, they have no idea what that looks like. Um, I know we're certainly not there, but I don't think the answer is to like revert the other direction either. That's a, certainly a hard question. You're always bringing the good question, Sesson. What are your concluding thoughts, Sesson? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think it's a conversation that I imagine us having again because it's so, you know, thinking about how we call people um, out and how we're figuring out as a society, how do we improve our the human condition, like it requires mm -hmm. community dialogue, right? It can't be done in the very individual level only. I think like you said, Patricia, it's figuring out how we're not there yet. And we are increasingly becoming a more, um, you know, polarized society as a result, I think, where we don't know how to come together in some really difficult dialogue. Um, and it just reminds me that their work is great. There's a lot of it to do. And I don't know that um, communities necessarily always have the support systems built in to really know how to, you know, um, lean across the aisle and really figure out how to have these, you know, moments that can create profound change and growth. And for me, it's all in an attempt to help people um, shift into healthier relational patterns um, and treat each other better with kindness. And that, to get there can be complicated and it can result in some fractures, right? And ruptures along the way. But if we're trying to, you know, we want to minimize that, right? We don't right. want the only way for people to grow and learn to be through forcing them into spaces that cause a lot of pain and injury as well. So, um I think, you know, there's a lot of conversation and uh, effort to still be placed in this work. But I'm really glad that issues are being brought to the surface that have often been minimized or considered private in ways that hasn't necessarily kickstart the kind of change that we desperately need. So mm -hmm. it's figuring out how not to be reactive on either end of it, right? Like how Ugh. not to be on either extreme Probably of that. So hard. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think that's where a lot of the thoughtfulness has to come from is like, how do we find something in between that doesn't stall change, but that also, um, you know, thinks about people on the individual and relational level as well, right? So. So well said.
Now we're going to move to our academic deep dive segment and discuss a new article published in the Journal of Family Psychology. I love that journal, primarily because they've published some of my work. Title. <laughs> yeah, no, none. <laughs> it's a different kind of publication bias. Oh, that's really good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll call out the article, the journals that haven't published my work. Don't you worry, I'll call them out publicly. Oh, they're not going to appear on the test. Don't worry, Patricia, I got it. <laughs> oh, mercy. Titled, What Happens When Romantic Couples Discuss Personal Loss, Relational, Emotional, and Physiological Impact. Written by a large team of researchers led by Gayla Magdalene at the University of Southern California. That's your neck of the woods, Sess. This study explores the possible benefits of discussing loss with a partner. Talking about loss can be challenging, even when we talk about it to people we're close to. We may risk being vulnerable, emotional, or having the person we're sharing with be unsure how to respond or be overly positive. It can also feel risky for the person listening to someone share about loss. Do we respond by validating the pain, encouraging positive thinking, or could we fail to be supportive at all? As we've discussed uh, before on Attached, disclosure and how a partner responds to our sharing is really key couple communication process. But as these authors point out, research hasn't really explored loss discussion, which may be unique for couples. Loss is very often something we can't control and that can't be fixed. There isn't a solution to grief. So the goal of these conversations may shift to solely bearing witness, providing emotional support, and potentially being vulnerable and getting even closer to one another, further strengthening your relationship ultimately. Earlier research on shared loss suggests that parents who survive the loss of a child may protect each other by not talking about the loss, which actually ends up intensifying their grief over time. And couples who don't disclose their fears about a cancer diagnosis report more stress and less closeness between them later on. But what does this look like for partners uh, to confide their personal losses, grief that their partner didn't experience? Do couples experience relief and intimacy or stress and pain? And if loss discussions are stressful, who experiences that stress? The partner sharing or the partner listening? A lot of heavy stuff here, Sarah, but I think this is just so critical to talk about. I remember often saying when I was practicing therapy that when I was trained as a therapist, grief was just not something I was actually trained to um, mm -hmm. help patients with and clients mm -hmm. with, unfortunately. Um, but I'm really curious about how this team explored these questions about sharing grief. Yeah. So they did this really interesting study uh, that involved 114 romantic couples, okay. heterosexual, fairly young on average, about 23 years old. Uh, I imagine because recruitment probably occurred at USC. I miss being in Southern California so much. It was a very diverse project, 29% uh, white, 25% Latinx, 16% multiracial, just across the board. Um, uh, 114 couples together, an average of about two and a half years, okay. uh, and 43% were living together. So um, that's a fairly um, uh, fair variety in sort of relationship types, I think. Uh, so they came to the lab and they did a baseline relaxation procedure, which means that they watched 10 minutes of nature video to sort of get them relaxed and um, uh, be able to sort of baseline see where their stress levels were. And that was followed by three discussions. So the first conversation that the couples had was a discussion of change that they wanted in their relationship. So the topics that they could discuss in that conversation were identified first by a survey and then the researchers would help to sort of um, figure out which topics maybe hadn't been discussed that much, but were going to be stressful. And then they were asked to talk about those in really a lot of detail, really share how they felt so that that was a meaningful comparison situation. 
And then the female was asked to share about a loss that she experienced, and the male was asked to talk about a loss that he had experienced, and they counterbalanced that meaning. For some couples, the woman went first, and for some couples, the men went first. Uh, Afterwards, there was a post-discussion questionnaire to assess sort of how each of those conversations was experienced. So what they were asked to do when talking about these losses was to talk about past losses that were still a significant source of distress or sadness that their partner knew little, if anything, about. Um, So these might sort of be more remote losses, but that were still impactful, um, which these researchers talked about, it might be sort of hard to think about how fairly young couples who are probably undergraduate students um, are... Uh, how significant of a loss could they possibly have experienced at that sort of point in their life. But on average, these participants experienced four losses. And some of them were incredibly significant in terms of what we would think of being ultimate stressful losses. They um, experienced the death of a parent, the murder of a cousin. Um, They also experienced things like disability, death of a friend, parents' divorce. So it wasn't all grief tied to death, but really fairly profound losses. And they, of course, had them rate how sad they were at the time and how sad they were now to sort of uh, allow the researchers to assist these partners to select a loss that would be um, potent, but also something that they hadn't talked about thoroughly with their partner to really capture what that looks like. Then they were asked to share about that loss for 10 minutes communicate why it was meaningful and how it still affects their life. I think what's really important to think about how the study may sort of apply to uh, real life is that the listener was asked to really understand what the narrator was saying, to comment, to ask questions, to really create a conversation Mm. rather than be sort of a passive listener to a loss monologue. Um, And so it was really about engaging in each of these discussions. They then also tracked how the person sharing and the listener um, changed in terms of physiological arousal. So they looked at activation of the sympathetic nervous system by measuring electrical activity in the skin or the skin conductance responses during the course of listening, but also sharing, uh, as well as those change in the relationship discussions as their sort of control comparison condition, Mm -hmm. which is really interesting, right? Because it's not just self-report, it's also looking at how does their body become sort of aroused and activated when they're talking about this. Because I think a lot of times what people are worried about in talking about loss or also responding to people's losses is that that can be stressful experience it can be really activating and really feel dysregulating um so i think it's a really interesting approach that they took to look at that piece too so what they found was that sharing about one's own loss was associated with more emotional vulnerability which meant um, more emotions like sadness especially for women and hopelessness also a bit more anger which they were surprised about but then they sort of shared they weren't they hadn't differentiated anger at a partner versus anger at a situation in general, Mm. which I thought is an interesting distinction. Um, It would make sense how for some of these losses, you could still be experiencing quite a bit of anger. That is really a part of grief often, right? Very, I would say, maybe always. Um, In the change discussions, they saw more irritability and physiological arousal than in either of the conversations about loss, whether you're sharing or listening. Um, In both of the loss discussions, whether you're sharing or listening, those partners also describe feeling more close to their partner, more relationship closeness Mm -hmm. when they were done, which is also, I think, a key part of what these authors are exploring. Um, Women in general became less physiologically aroused when sharing about their own loss. Men tended to sort of say the same. Uh, Both men and women significantly increased arousal as they were listening, which is uh, the author sort of described this as potentially part of sharing the emotional load. Mm. That's also on average, not true for everyone, so that they also looked at arousal patterns within couples rather than just within individual partners. Oh, fascinating. What they found was that women sharing about loss, the most common pattern was that women, when sharing, decreased in their arousal while men listening showed increasing arousal. Again, that was most common. It was about maybe a third of these couples, but not true for everybody. And that when men shared about loss, the most common pattern was that they both increased in arousal. But mutual decreases in arousal, meaning 
couples where both of the partners became less physiologically aroused and potentially dysregulated um, occurred in about 30% of the women's loss discussions they're sharing about loss and 22% of men discussing loss, which means that that mutual congruent decreasing in arousal, becoming physiologically in sync and down-regulating together mm-hmm. was also associated with higher relationship closeness after the loss discussion oh, uh, when compared to the congruent increases, increasing in arousal together or incongruent arousal, which was most common when women were sharing about loss. But if we both came down together, if we both found it, these are my words, if we both found that conversation soothing, whether I'm sharing or listening, um, uh, and for women, when they were sharing, it was especially uh, beneficial for the relationship. So I think especially now in this context of, at least at work, um, clinically, what I am seeing in working with patients uh, that come in for all kinds of reasons, most often for regular primary care visits, and I just get pulled in because we identify mm-hmm. sort of a stress or a struggle. Grief is almost entirely part of the picture at this point because yeah. of COVID and all the different losses that COVID has contributed, not just loss of close family members, but also this disability piece, loss of identity, job loss, financial loss. I mean, grief is profound, I think, in our society right now. And so what do wow. we do with all that grief, right? Yeah. A lot of the work I do clinically is talking with people about who knows that this is what's going on for you, who knows you're struggling like this, who you share this with. And I think I mean, it's not 100% of people, surely. Um, It's a lot of people who say, nobody, I don't talk to anybody about this because I don't want to burden anybody Mm. else. And so although I think the study um, is of young couples, um, it's also looking at momentary effects, right? It's not looking at longitudinal changes when they invite these couples, these young couples to talk about this loss. What does their relationship trajectory look like? It's not looking at that. It's looking at momentary changes. It is showing that there's some benefit to discussing with your partner these losses that you've experienced. And for these couples, it wasn't even necessarily recent loss that they'd even talked about before. This was something new, different, potentially scary, um, and not necessarily potentially very easy. Uh, They were talking about it for 10 minutes. They were encouraged to be really, really engaged. But what they found was more of these soft emotions, partners experiencing uh, learning something new and also really getting closer to their partner, which I think points to this experience of compassion um, relief, that physiological downregulation, especially when it happens together, I think it's potentially, even if it's momentary relief, that is powerful. And to say that it translates into feeling closer with your partner makes yeah. total sense in the context of the broad research that we know about how being vulnerable and being open with your partner creates relationship closeness, mm-hmm. right? Um I think there's also something to be said about how the partner responds. Like I said earlier, listeners were encouraged to engage in the conversation and to be curious and not just be passive listeners and certainly not to encourage positivity in the face of grief, because that is a go to for a lot of people to talk about like, oh, well, of course, you know, um, you never get more than you can handle or they're in a better place or it sounds like it was a good thing that your parents divorced. mysterious ways. All of those things are so undermining and invalidating. So these listeners were coached to be engaged um, and to be curious and ask questions. And I think that is such a perfect, simple model for how we can show up for people that we care about when they're sharing about their grief. Absolutely uh, amazing article. Wow. So much to think about, too, both in my personal life, the research that uh, I'm doing right now with breast cancer patients. But also one thing I'm curious, um, you guys, from a clinical perspective, is it seems that that down regulation during the conversation might be really a key to that closeness too. And I'm curious how in a clinical setting you might teach that. Is that something that is teachable? What does that look like from a therapeutic standpoint? Ceci, you want to take that first? Yeah, sure. Um, (laughs) You know, I was reading this article and feeling very much like, gosh, it gives a lot of encouragement for, I think, a therapist reading this to really try to get your clients to that point, right? Where you know the outcomes can be beneficial if you were to help a couple find that you were talking about down regulation. It's like to get them there so that they could benefit from some of the outcomes of that, which clearly I'm so glad to see it reinforced, but that sense of closeness, right? That stems from that. 
you know, the work to get there depends sometimes on the couple, right? So Mm -hmm. whether or not a couple can get there, my answer typically is yes, but it could take a lot of hard work and some time depending on the couple and particularly some of their, the history that they have as individuals and relationally um, around the traumas that they've experienced. So, um, you know, I didn't see the article talk a lot about trauma, but it did bring that up for me in reading it because I'm thinking, gosh, the trauma that um, some of these uh, participants may have brought into this experience. I was really curious about that because if you have complex untreated trauma, right, to do that work of downregulating mm. with your partner is considerably mm-hmm. difficult, right? And so it really does require, you know, um, for folks to really do some of that work and healing, right? To be able to get to a point where they can hear someone else's pain and, you know, often trauma that's associated with grief and to really know how to effectively be in support of that person. Mm-hmm. Because whether mm-hmm. we want to support our partner or not, sometimes, um, the trauma that we have can really is, act as a barrier to that. Get in the way. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. It's like we love our partner. We really want to be there for them. We see them in so much pain. But my gosh, what they said triggered me. Well, you know, I'm still suffering myself and I don't know how to separate their pain right now yeah. from mine. It's not an easy thing to unpack and someone else's pain with them when you are in, highly activated by the loss that, you know, you've experienced, losses, right? Maybe you've experienced that you still haven't really worked on. Um, so the trauma piece is really critical here too, I think. Um, and so many people have untreated trauma, right? Have oh, yeah. not worked towards healing um, some of the traumatic losses that they've had in their life. Um, and that can have profound effects on how couples are able to turn to each other, even in these newer moments of grief and loss that people um, share with their partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that most common pattern that they discovered when women are sharing about a loss, they decrease in arousal. They find that sharing to be helpful. They're able to experience some of those softer, harder emotions. They are um, being particularly vulnerable, right? While men listening experience increasing arousal, it's also possible it's tied to sort of this narrative we often hear in um, uh, relationships between men and women where men feel a lot of pressure to fix whatever they're hearing about. In grief, right, the Mm. authors point out from the start, these are not very solvable situations. This is loss, especially if it's remote and the kinds of losses these people were experiencing. These are not fixable things. You're having to bear witness without coming up with a solution. And that sort of tension around the cultural narrative of men sometimes needing to have a solution where women are experiencing the benefits of being able to be open, um, I think sometimes that's a pretty um, important narrative to call attention to Mm. and to point to and can be a really sometimes a simple sort of subtle paradigm shift of inviting, I think, um, the female partner to share that what she's looking for is exactly potentially what you're giving or able to give. Um, There's no fix we're looking for here. Mm. It's you showing up to listen. And I sort of wonder how that might shift the arousal piece that they were observing there for men too, and might also be beneficial for then women to have that need met maybe more often um, without sort of being in the face of somebody who wants to solve it. Um, yeah. And I do wonder if in those types of um, dynamics where could the woman or the partner visually see the increase in arousal in their partner? Sure. And I is, think, yeah, I would imagine. And is that going to prevent that from happening again in the future? Sure, that might question. be linked mm-hmm. to the, um, closeness piece yeah. as well because i can imagine sharing something yeah. vulnerable and you're getting a, a response that's Ooh, a physiological uncomfortable yeah mm-hmm. uh yeah up that would make me feel hesitant um mm-hmm. to do that again so yeah um i understand um it's just such fascinating research um i love mm-hmm. the dyadic nature of it i love the mm-hmm. physiological um aspect mm-hmm. of it too and i think it speaks so much to what we can do clinically and even explaining mm-hmm. this research that you are having a physiological response here are some tools and tricks of how to like help down regulate yourself i think could also be something that we could teach people and i know mm-hmm. people are doing already in couples therapy as well being uh 
mindful and aware of what your body is doing and how to help your body um, down regulate or calm down after you recognize those physiological upticks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, last thing I'll say on this is that I think it's so important to recognize that when we go into relationships with a lot of unprocessed trauma and something traumatic happens, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the relationship that sort of forces mm -hmm. us to face a new loss, mm -hmm. right? And trauma, it can be highly activating for our own right. past trauma, right? And yep. it can yep. stand in the way of demonstrating that attunement, that empathy toward yep. our partner. Yep. And so Safety. what, yeah, and what we sometimes perceive is my partner doesn't care or get it, or they're all about solving yep. the problem is my partner has not had their own experiences validated, mm -hmm. supported, a mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. to really do their own healing. So you face, you see people who suffer in a relationship and have conflict because gosh, they're both having their histories, their losses, you know, they've gone unsupported, right? And it's not mm -hmm. just my partner doesn't care and want to support me or all they care about is solving it is if they had to have space for their pain to be processed, they may actually physically and emotionally not know how to recreate mm -hmm. that for someone else. Yeah. Yeah. So it reminds me as a therapist, like just how to conceptualize it when somebody can't um, be present and can't mm. necessarily turn and support their partner. It's, the assumption is that there may be something for me more that I need to explore about their own past, right? And about their own losses that we need to account for before we start to quickly think about how do we help them change, right? Um, their right. responses, right? It's not necessarily going back to like, it's not all about communication. It's what yeah, influences right. that, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Boo! Woohoo! Yeah! Finally, time for good or bad advice, where we talk about pervasive relationship advice in our culture. We hear relationship advice from parents, families, friends. We see advice about how to be in relationship from movies and TV shows. And we read endless advice spewed at us on social media, blogs, and all of those numerous top 10 lists. But you guys are going to be shocked by this. A lot of it just actually isn't good for our relationships. What? I know. This is the part of the show where we use science, mind you, to decide if the advice is good or bad. If you have seen or heard some advice you'd like us to talk about, please send it to us. Email at us at attachedpodcast at gmail.com. Get at us on the Twitter, the Instagram, the Facebook, or the meta, I'm sorry, at Attached Podcast, or go to attachedpodcast.com and send us a message. While you're at it, as always, kindly please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app or YouTube um, and share it with your loved ones. I find that loved ones love it when you're in the middle of an argument and you're like, hey, listen, I have an idea about a podcast you can listen to. They love it. Ideal times to recommend our podcast is when you guys are both heightened and aroused not sexually mind you <laughs> okay so that was a joke all of that was a joke please don't do that in the middle of a fight <laughs> okay um so ladies and gentlemen out there in the world i have been rapidly consuming period pieces um sh period piece shows not period piece, artwork i've been consuming artwork no um think of north south sanditon Emma Outlander, I've just been like rabidly binging. I've been binging all of these. Yeah, that's the culturally appropriate term. You're right. I mean, the, the hip term. <laughs> I can't even say the word. Um, and for sure, Bridgerton. Have you guys um, experienced Bridgerton? Yes. Are you so proud of me? Oh my gosh, I am really, really proud of you. I had no <laughs> idea. Both seasons? Oh, yes. What? <gasps> <laughs> Uh, Sess? Very proud moment. I see PR just like <laughs> beaming. It's just it. for Patricia. I only watched for Patricia, <laughs> knowing she would be proud. Oh, man. I feel behind now. I have not because I've been enthralled, deeply enthralled with Outlander. And <gasps> I, oh, I my can't. God. That's it's, another it's, one. It's, it's bad. It's. I mean, it's so good. It's bad. It's what bad. season of Outlander are you on? Netflix forced me to stop at five. Um, oh. Oh, hey, you got far though. It's um, 
you know, binge watching during my vacations late at night. Love it. I love it. I love it. Beyond when I should. Um, so I know we're talking about a different show, so we'll save this one. For another, but I have not been able to do that. And this other one, which I hear is getting all this like, you know, Netflix yeah. acclaim. And so it's on my list. I just don't feel like. I'm being loyal to Outlander until I'm done with it. I don't no, know. it's fair. No, I totally respect that. That totally makes sense. Um, but both of them are are different, but fantastic. Um, but today, uh, we're going to talk about Bridgerton. Uh, we can do Outlander another time. There's so much to talk about with Outlander for sure. Um, so period dramas, generally, all of these things. Oh, and also, if you guys haven't seen North and South, a four-part miniseries on BBC that came out in 2004. Um, so 2004? <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I, 20 <laughs> years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's really, really good. You can find it on Amazon Prime. Oh, so fantastic. Um, but so I just love period dramas. There's just something about them um, in these period dramas. No matter what there is, there's always some profession of love like someone professes their love to someone or what love is or about love or the meaning of love or there's always some talk about love and finding each other and how you know what love looks like and all of these things sometimes these <laughs> statements of love and what it is can really propagate unhealthy expectations of what like falling in love looks like but other times they kind of are spot on. I'm like, whoa, you said that like poetry. Like it really, wow, that's really, really nice. Um, so today I'm going to give you both some love quotes from the first two seasons of Bridgerton and then we can talk about it. All right. Are you guys ready? Yes. And I won't say them in a British accent, though there's a part of me that wants to, but I won't do it. So <laughs> quote one is from season two, Daphne Bridgerton. Um the one that makes it impossible for you to look away from them at any given moment, when your body and soul feel as if they could burst into flames whenever the two of you are near. So she's talking about how you know you love someone. So what are we thinking? Good or bad advice about what love might look like and how to recognize it? I mean, it's not good advice. That's not I mean, I guess it depends on what kind of love you're wanting to define. I also am not a fan of Daphne Bridgerton. Oh, my. All, all things what? I know. I did not prefer the first season of that show. The um, second season is better. I agree. It doesn't appear to be what I have read. I don't care. I, Daphne Bridgerton is just um, a character that just bothers me a bunch. Okay. And um, so when she shared this really uh, misplaced guidance that season two, her brother, I was like, why are you even in the show? I thought you already moved off property. Where are you? <laughs> Sarah uh, with the hot takes. Oh my God. I love oh, it. She's back just to give more bad advice. Um, so I mean, it's a definition of maybe lust. I don't yeah. know that. I mean, she's describing it not only as like you have a soul soulmate there's a soulmate possibility and it's about sexual attraction well that isn't for some people just necessarily even one person and also it just is not any sort of definition that is about sustaining a relationship which is the kind of advice she's trying to give in yeah. this episode and so no i think it's bad advice from a bad character <laughs> <laughs> so the duchess bad advice duchess yeah, not down says what are your thoughts yeah, I don't know Bridget. Um, or Daphne. Yes, Brit I don't know the characters <laughs> yet. So Her I last feel like I am the most objective person on this I panel. I agree on this panel, so, this pro highly professional panel that we're on. Does my opinion That's count for all of us? Um, <laughs> so I agree with um, Sarah's uh, account here. Clearly, this doesn't sound like love as it, much as it sounds like. Um, lust. It's a very strong physiological response. Mm -hmm. And usually when we're talking about love, I think um, my take on it is to be in love is not to be in this constant, this extreme arousal state, right? It's a more tempered balance between your physiological connection and your emotional connection. So I think it is someone in the throes of passion and lust, which is great, but it's not love. So sorry, Daph. We're doing that bad advice. Sounded good, but yeah. Quote two, season two, Anthony Bridgerton, the Viscount. Um, 
You are the bane of my existence and the object of all my desires. Night and day I dream of you. <laughs> you're bad. holding back. You're Advice. at 30% of <laughs> how know. you want to deliver I know. it. I didn't, want, <laughs> I didn't want to do it with like the full like thrust of intensity yeah. that he did because he delivered it so well. This actor who plays Anthony, I mean, beyond so fantastic every single thing he does and i'm like yes i agree with you so i'm really interested um in you guys' wow. opinions because i clearly need to be brought back down to earth i like it <laughs> i do think I, so this is one of the takes that i have read because uh-huh. now i am oh. into i i know because i watched it and was Mercy. like i didn't have a patricia to talk about it with yet so then i had to go look and see how people were experiencing it and i feel like this is the take that i read people were frustrated with the most in terms of it being an unhealthy relationship mm-hmm. like depiction of relationships is that it's this type of relationship in like literature where you see like i hate you therefore i love you yeah and that that isn't sustainable it's very interesting to me because I didn't experience this relationship that way. Like, I understand that that may have been, I don't know anything about this book, so I don't read the books, but it may have been sort of what that was trying to convey, but I never really understood why they necessarily disliked each other very much. And so it didn't ever feel like you're the bane of my existence, honestly, while watching. Now, Mm. I think this kind of advice is, again, not how you sustain a relationship. Um, he can dream all day if he wants and that's totally fantastic and also if he's talking about therefore we should marry and spend the rest of our lives together not great advice for how to build a foundation yeah it's really physical and sexual the object of all my desires is like i and then i think afterwards he says something like do you know all of the ways a woman can be seduced or something to that effect i'm not really sure i haven't memorized you're not really sure (laughs) she rolls up her sleeve to show her tattoo i don't oh yeah it looks like it is that's the next line okay cool (laughs) so this one definitely is about that physiological arousal um sexual in this time says thoughts I mean, not much to add there, except I just, you know, I read this and I think someone who's highly emotionally reactive (laughs) and um, this doesn't sound very healthy as well. I think, um, you know, the bane of one's existence and the object of all their desires saying someone who is, um, you know, uh, reactive on both extremes and that can be exhausting. I'm glad this is a show and not real life because this person Mm -hmm. would... (laughs) Have my recommendation for lots of rest and a little space from this character. Maybe pick up running as an activity. To be fair, he has unhealed trauma to reference your prior conversation. He's got some serious trauma that is absolutely informing how he struggles to form relationships. Would you I not would, say, Patricia? Mm-hmm. That is very key. And also he's felt like he's had to shut down his emotions almost his entire adult life. All of them. Yeah, because of that trauma. So they're all coming flooding back immediately. Wow, I think maybe we could do like five more episodes of this podcast on Bridgerton. I can't wait for uh, Sesson to watch this. <laughs> so the next quote, season one, Lady Whistledown. The ones we love have the power to inflict the greatest scars. For what thing is more fragile than the human heart? I'm going to say good advice, actually. I also think they do this character so wrong in this show. I'm hoping season three or four or whenever, I don't know how many they have planned, like writes this wrong. Eight. They have eight Shonda seasons. has eight seasons. No, really? Mm-hmm. There are eight books. I'm on book four right now. Oh, you're reading them too. Okay, so you know ahead. So uh, Allegedly, regardless, yeah. I this do Is Shonda think... Rhimes show? Mm-hmm. Sorry. It is. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yes. So this character does a lot of observing yeah. of relationships. Yeah, so Lady Whistledown is the person who, like, writes the gossip. It's like Gossip Girl. Lady Whistledown is the Gossip Girl. Um, Shonda Rhimes is not the showrunner. It's someone else is the showrunner, but it's Shonda Land Productions. She tends to ride things so the wheels fall off. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was said in a way that I didn't mean. Can we? I mean, how long did grades go on? You're not wrong. It's still going. No, it's we were in grad school. It's 18 years. And then I don't know what happened with the Kerry Washington show, but that went off oh, the rails. Oh, scandal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those first two seasons were so good. And then so you're good. right. The wheels went in directions. I was like, I can't keep up. What is that show about jumping the shark? But I don't think it's like no. that exactly as much as it is just like, 
So when you're talking about how many seasons, I can imagine okay. eight turning into a lot. Eight. Yeah. Yeah, I hope not. There are only eight books, and so hopefully they'll just do each book is one of the Bridgerton children. Oh, clever. So, that makes yeah. sense. We're going down the line. Going well, down the line. I think this is good advice. I think that um, the people that we love the most definitely have the potential to hurt us the most. Um, and uh, I think good advice. Mm-hmm. I agree. Super That's- based in science. My answer just said. <laughs> <laughs> it just is. Very cool. Well, I think it is, especially attachment science. You see how just the, oh, the right? <laughs> Susan rescued it. You know, the people, especially those who um, you have developed uh, caring attach relationships um, with who are especially in a primary care role, um, but then throughout your life, right, where you develop these close um, intimate relationships, have ways to access, right, your vulnerability and, you know, really leave you feeling both incredibly connected and harmed when things happen in the relationship. So it is, um, I think it's like the beauty of the human condition, but also like a tragedy in some ways that the person yeah. that, you know, it's poetic. <laughs> well, there's been millions of people who've said it, you know, beautifully about it. It's just like the person who you're closest to um, can have the ability to also just um, really wreck you. Yeah, wreck you. And um, like a wrecking ball. Right. And they say the opposite of love is not. She hate. says, right. <laughs> right. Like, oh, yeah. Like Good a, take. Well, I like Miley Cyrus references. So <laughs> <laughs> she's phenomenal, by the way. Have you been listening I think to some of her fun. recent covers? She's fun. Fantastic. Yeah, I do enjoy her. All right. Uh, next quote. Moving along because we have th- uh, three more to like fit into this episode. So let's pick up the pace here, ladies. Um, next, uh, Daphne Bridgerton, season one. Just because something is not perfect does not make it any less worthy of love. Oh, I mean, for Daphne, <laughs> it's a good take. <laughs> um, I mean, I think in the context that she's intending it is probably good advice in terms of literally there's no reality in Probably good advice. I mean, I guess you came up with something. It fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, I there's uh, to expect perfection in a relationship is a really uh, big risk factor for I think being quickly and eternally disappointed. And <laughs> nobody is perfect. Um, and when we get in relationships, we have formed an imperfect union out of two imperfect people. So, uh, fine, Daphne can have it. <laughs> <laughs> she says enthusiastically, Sesson. <laughs> I'm glad you recovered there at the end because I was beginning to wonder if you thought perfection was a requirement. Of <laughs> what is happening? Her dislike of this character is changing her so profoundly. <laughs> All the years of like lived experience and, and research <laughs> down the drain. Um, Flush it. <laughs> no, I agree. I think it is. Um, you know, when people are demonstrating imperfection is sometimes when they need our love the most and our patience. And so, they- so why am I even here? But I mean, <laughs> Sesson's up first next because I'm all right. Sesson got just- it next. <laughs> we'll bounce Stop. back and forth. <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> this is what happens when I actually watch the shows. I just this fall is, apart. This is me completely okay. unfamiliar with the characters. I have no investment in them. Just goes to tell you how much people can affect us, even people who are not real. <laughs> even that take was good. <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes when we're seeing imperfection, we're seeing someone in a moment of um, vulnerability and struggle is when we need to lean in and, and support them with our love and um, to withhold it um, and to think they're any less worthy of that love is really harmful to that relationship and to their potential to grow and heal from whatever they're struggling with. So, um, yeah, we're all imperfect in so many ways, right? More than just one. And so um, I'm grateful for all the people who have invested in me, right, despite that. Mm. And I think we all can say that. Yep, good advice, Daphne. <laughs> all right, season one, Simon Bassett, the Duke. Uh, he's a burning gentleman. Um, romance was entirely out of the question for both of us, but in so removing it, we found something far greater. We found friendship. What? I would say it's good advice. <laughs> I have to 
Look at you and your takes. So saucy. (laughs) She said timidly. I think probably what makes up friendship in the way that he's referring to are the pieces that we would otherwise consider foundational to healthy, satisfying romantic relationships in terms of being open and communicating, being close. They've created trust and safety. I mean, they have a whole sort of pact where they're really having to trust each other in that season one. And they do, and they find out what they have in common, and they just enjoy spending time together. And all of those are really foundational building blocks for when you build, uh, then have romance on top of that as an additional ingredient in the way I think he's meaning to. I would agree that it's a much healthier way to have a relationship. Very different, mind you, than how Daphne is describing what will keep their relationship going. So <laughs> Duke one, Duchess zero. <laughs> Sessin, what are your thoughts? The Duke, Simon? Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, it just reminds me that there's a lot of pressure that we feel to be in romantic relationships and how they should look, whereas friendships feel like a different approach. So mm. by taking that pressure off of, people to have to feel a certain way, right? Because that's what sort of comes with this idea of romance and being in a romantic relationship is that you're supposed to have a certain level of attraction, feel a certain amount of intimacy. But with friendship, I think you can come in with a lot less expectations for yourself in the relationship and the other person. So I think, you know, in stating that it felt like something greater for them, something more important is that friendship. I think that makes sense because they could come in without all the expectations and pressure to mm. be this thing to each other, which I think it is really beautiful thing about friendships is that you can come in and really be yourself a lot more than in romantic relationships. It would be wonderful if we could all sort of think about entering all romantic relationships from a place of like, friendship Mm -hmm. right I think we could all show up a lot more authentically (laughs) I can't tell you the how sometimes I struggle to watch people not be themselves when they try to be in a romantic relationship in those first several months and how that ultimately doesn't serve them well because eventually they will be themselves and that will play out in the relationship the way it sometimes does so goodness it would be nice if we that was the prerequisite you must be friends first right yeah yes the Duke just nailing it like he always does. Am I right? Oh, double entendre. <laughs> Double I entendre. It. Um, I it. Last but certainly not least, season two, Anthony um, Bridgerton. I know I am imperfect, but I will humble myself before you because I cannot imagine my life without you. And that is why I wish to marry you. This is his second proposal. Not to spoil anything. Uh, okay, I'm going to say good advice from the perspective of humility is a good trait to have. Also, if he's aware enough to know that he's imperfect, mm. that's not the worst thing in the world. Probably, especially at that at that time, of like re- the Regency period, right? You have huge gender disparities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. yeah sure. no, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I told you I didn't want to go first anymore. (laughs) No, I think, sure, that's good advice. I'm not sure about that. I can't imagine myself living life without you piece, which is maybe what you're trying to target here, Patricia. I think that is maybe one romantic ideal on reason why you might want to marry someone. And that's okay. So long as there's other pieces that are going to sustain you, because at some point, Often, couples do imagine a life without their partner. And then what else is there sort of holding them together in terms of commitment, loyalty, shared goals and expectations? I don't think, again, that that's how relationships were formed back then. But in the context of applying it as relationship advice today, I would say humility and self-awareness are good. um, Wise words. Humility and self-awareness are good. (laughs) Sesson? I think it does. That's it. I like, um, yes, I agree with Sarah. And also I'm looking Here at she the does. statement. Here she- I do. And, I and think now it- something much more profound. Go <laughs> on. <laughs> I don't know how to interpret this statement because I think I'm reading it as in two ways. One, I am imperfect. And I think you're accepting me for that. And that's why I wish to marry you. Or 
it could also, in the way I'm reading it, mean I can't imagine my life without you, which is why I want to marry you. Either way, I think if it's the former, I support that idea, of course, because I think if someone is entering a relationship, a state of union, with the understanding that that person isn't expecting perfection from them, if they understand that they can come into that relationship with their flaws, of course, with the hope and expectation for growth, um, that is a person that they want to be with, that that is someone that they can imagine life with because they're not expected to come in fully formed, fully, you know, um, in a state of um, knowing everything and being everything to them. I mean, there's a lot of unpacking the statement and a lot of assuming of what it means, but yeah. that's my take if I'm reading it the way I think it was intended, having never watched the show. So. And I can't wait for you to watch this show. Um, it'll rot your brain. <laughs> and I am very eager. I sort of wish now we all sort of like started it together and like could have sure. chats about mm-hmm. it, but maybe there's a different show we can do that with. I love that idea. Season four <laughs> of Attached, not Bridgerton. Anyway, um, as always, thank you for listening to Attached. Remember, call us, email us, or get at us on all those social medias about relationship advice you've received and you're wondering whether to follow or pass on. We cannot wait to talk about it. <laughs>